Good morning, church family. Before um, we begin, um, we have um, N.O. Myers, who's the chair of council, who has a special announcement to make. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, to church this morning. It's, uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here in this building, and um, I uh, hope uh, that everybody has a, a wonderful worship service wherever they find themselves uh, this morning. Uh, this last year has been a, um, an unusual year, to say the least. Um, I expect that uh, every one of us at one point or another uh, suddenly thought of somebody and thought, my goodness, we haven't seen these people in a long time. Um, uh, this sense of uh, disconnect uh, within the congregation is uh, heightened by the fact that we haven't been able to worship in person um, so we've had virtual worship services. Our staff uh, experienced a significant uh, amount of a learning curve in figuring out the technology in order to uh, continue our worship and our programming. And uh, they've done a marvelous job. Um, and all of this was taking place, this work by the staff, uh, in the absence of uh, Pastor Borgert, who had uh, just uh, before the pandemic left for Chatham. Um, God has been faithful to all of us through all of this. Our elders have been uh, diligent in making contact with their districts. Our members have remained faithful in terms of their attendance, their prayers, and their giving. And uh, this is the point of the announcement. God has also blessed the work of our pastor search committee. That's Phyllis Alberts, uh, Kim Borgdorf, uh, Nathaniel Kuperis, uh, John DeWinter, um, Ed uh, Isis, uh, Paul and uh, Moses uh, have also uh, been uh, sitting in on the committee as well. Um, the committee has been making uh, at least, a uh, meeting, pardon me, at least weekly for, for months. Uh, they have uh, considered and dialogued with a, a large number of uh, pastors. And it seems to happen so often uh, while they're looking in one direction, uh, God uh, blesses their work in a different direction that they didn't see coming. Uh, they have been in contact uh, with Reverend Nick and Amy Bowling. Um, they applied for the job. They were nowhere on the radar. But uh, Nick and uh, Amy Bowling are uh, ordained in the uh, Reformed Church of America. They've been ministering as a team for over 17 years uh, at the uh, Ferry Memorial Reformed Church in uh, Montague, Michigan. They're, uh, they share a single pastorate together as a husband and wife. In other words, uh, both of them will fill a single job. Although uh, they are currently with the Reformed Church, uh, they have a considerable history and background with the uh, um, Christian Reformed Church. Uh, Amy uh, Borling was uh, born and raised uh, Christian Reformed. Both went to Trinity. Both attended a year at uh, Calvin Seminary and then both attended Western Theological Seminary. Um, there are uh, many uh, aspects uh, about their ministry that uh, Reverend uh, Nick and uh, Amy uh, impressed the uh, committee with. Uh, they were impressed by their enthusiasm, their demeanor, uh, their vision of a team ministry which is uh, unique in their experience. And when Council spoke to them by Zoom last week, uh, we were uh, equally uh, struck and impressed. And uh, after a meeting with uh, the Bowerings and uh, Council, uh, Council met together and voted unanimously to recommend that the congregation extend a call uh, to uh, Reverend Nick and uh, Reverend Amy Bowling. Bowling, pardon me. Um, next week, uh, we'll send out more information about them. Uh, we will uh, include the letter from the calling committee which contains uh, links to services that uh, you can check out and sermons. Uh, we anticipate that they will lead us in worship on uh, April 18 and uh, 25, and we encourage you to um, 
obviously uh, attend in on that as well. We're confident that you, like us, uh, will find them to be a blessing for our congregation and our church. Their wide range of gifts, their uh, talent uh, will fit well, uh, we believe, with uh, our staff and our program, and we're thankful to God for this development, and uh, we will uh, look forward uh, to where it will lead us together. Thank you, Eno. It's, uh, it's wonderful um, to hear uh, how the Spirit continues to work uh, in and through the life of um, the church. Um, and it's wonderful, as um, I was looking forward, looking into this week, um, all the wonderful things that are happening, although we are scattered. Um, just a few announcements. <clears throat> as as has been tradition for a few weeks now, there's coffee hour um, after worship on Zoom, and the link you can find in the description and also in the midweek communication that went out on Thursday. And in your bulletin, there's a notice for a congregational meeting on April the 7th to approve the nomination of office bearers and to approve the financial statements of the year 2020. You will also be receiving an information uh, about balloting and a separate email with all the information coming this week. Um, as Stephanie announced um, in, in the midweek communication, we are asking for Easter greeting uh, video invitation. Um, do we have something to play here? Yes. Hello, church family. Here at the church, we are busy getting ready for Easter. And before we know it, the big day will be here. So we wanna invite you, our church family, to share your Easter greetings with each other. You can say something like, Happy Easter, or the peace of Christ be with you, or blessed Easter. Whatever you wanna share, take a video, send it to me, music at firstcrcberry.com. We would love to have a beautiful greeting video including as many people as we can from our church family. See you soon. Yes. Hello, so if, church family. So if you can send that um, to, to Stephanie at music at firstcrcberry.com, uh, we would love to see many of you. Um, and it was so wonderful last year when we had that uh, Easter greeting. Um, so no matter whether you're old or young, or you may, may want to include your, your loving pets as well, We'd love to hear an Easter greeting from all of you. And, and if you feel that you are technologically um, scared of doing that, if you let one of the staff know, we'll try to find a way to get that working. This evening, um, we have a Lenten prayer service at 7 p.m. It's been premiered on YouTube. I hope that you will be blessed as we worship, as we listen to music, um, prayers, and, and scripture being read together, and as we also share in communion together. It will be at 7 p.m. on YouTube. Throughout Holy Week, um, there will be uh, a daily MailChimp that will go out from the office with um, a daily devotional that will be led by one of the members of staff. Um, I pray that you look forward to that, and I hope that it will help you as you walk through Holy Week. Next week is Easter Sunday, uh, Resurrection Sunday, and um, although we'd love to be here together, uh, we will be worshiping through the live stream as well, just exactly how you are right now. So please don't, um, don't come to church. Um, we, we would love to have you here but uh, we are still trying to find the best way that we can reopen. So please keep the reopening committee uh, in prayer. Hold them up in prayer as we try to find ways that we can worship together, but also grow in love for our neighbors as well. At this time, let us gather together for... <clears throat> no, sorry. <laughs> let us pray. If you will join with me in prayer. Friends in Christ, for the five weeks of Lent, we have been preparing for the celebration of our Lord's suffering and death. Today, together with the whole church, we begin this holy week by welcoming our Messiah. So like the people of long ago, 
Let us welcome Jesus and follow him to the cross. So let us pray. King Jesus, gathering for worship today, we are like the crowd that lined the streets witnessing your entry into Jerusalem. Some of us gather full of enthusiasm. Some of us gather wearied by what life has thrown at us. But it is here, O God, that you meet us and greet us. And it is here that you surprise us with your love and your grace. So open our heavy eyes. Open our tired minds. Steal into our closed hearts and surprise us today with joy. Open us to the possibility of hope and allow us to glimpse the goodness of your purpose for us. Help us to join in the cry, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the King of Kings. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the King of Kings. Hosanna indeed. We sing praises to our King Jesus. Let's join together.
worship you, Lord Jesus. Our call to worship is found in Psalm 24, 7 and 10. If you will rise in body or in spirit. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, Lord strong, strong and, and mighty. mighty. The, the Lord, Lord mighty, mighty in, in battle. battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord, Lord Almighty. Almighty. He, he is the, the King, King of, of glory. glory. We have just called to worship saying, lift up our heads. Lift our gates. Open our, our gates so that we can invite the King in. But you know what actually happens is that God opens those gates and God greets us and God says hello and God says grace, mercy, and peace be unto you. From God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we have been greeted by God, let us take this time to turn our bodies, our physical bodies, our spiritual bodies, and as we greet our family members, our fellow neighbors with Hosanna, Hosanna. 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 Hosanna to you. We sing, the king of glory comes, the nation rejoices. To God in a prayer of confession. Loving God, you rode a donkey and came in peace, humbled yourself, and gave yourself for us. We confess our lack of humility. As you entered Jerusalem, the crowds shouted, Hosanna, save us now! On Good Friday, they shouted, Crucify! We confess our praise is often empty. We sing Hosanna, but cry, crucify. As the crowd laid their palms in front of you, you took the way of God. You took no glory for yourself. We confess that we want to be accepted and take the easy way. We do not stay true to your will. Forgive us, Lord and help us to follow in the way of obedience. Amen. Amen. The Bible tells us that when we confess our sin, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins because of Jesus' sacrifice for us. Let us together say these words of assurance from John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, 
but to save the world through him. We sing with praise to our King. God's will for our lives comes from Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Let the same mind in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Good morning, Shine Kids. 
I hope you're all doing well. Do any of you like to play dress up? It's fun to use your imagination, isn't it? I have a memory from when I was a kid of a dress up day at school called hat day, where teachers and students would bring in a hat and we would have fun playing dress up. I enjoyed seeing the different choices people would bring in, big hats, small hats, colorful wild hats, working hats. We had a fun time. You can tell a lot about a person by the hat he or she wears, maybe what job they have or what activity they're going to do. Let's play a guessing game together and we'll see if you can figure out what job I might have or where I'm going by the hat I wear. Here's the first one. This is a hard hat. I might be a construction worker if I was wearing this hat. Here's the next one. Where am I going? <sighs> Maybe I'm heading out to the beach. <laughs> the next one, this one might be tricky for you. Do you know who wears a hat like this? Maybe a chef or a baker? Hmm, I'm hungry for cookies now. <laughs> okay, what about this one? Maybe I'm going to play a round of golf. The last one I have to show you is very special. Who might wear a golden crown like this? A king or a queen, you're right, someone royal. Today's message is all about a king from a long time ago. He was different than other kings. He didn't get to wear a golden crown like this or have beautiful robes. He didn't live in a palace or have servants or soldiers to help him. He didn't even have a country to rule or a coin with his name or face on it. You might have guessed the king I'm speaking about is King Jesus. He's not just any king. He is the king of kings, the best king ever. His kingdom is not an earthly one, but a heavenly one. When Jesus was on earth, the people were hoping for a real life king who would set up his kingdom here and they could share in his wealth and his power. But that's not why Jesus came to earth. He came to earth to save us to rescue us from our sins so we could be a part of that heavenly kingdom with eternal life. Jesus did finally wear a crown, not a gold one like this though, a painful crown of thorns. He was willing to wear that painful crown of thorns to show his love for us. We'll learn more about Jesus' sacrifice later this week on Good Friday. But today is Palm Sunday, where we celebrate and remember Jesus' triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem, where the people welcomed him as their king by laying these palm branches down on the road in front of him. We celebrate today that Jesus is really the King of Kings still today. Would you pray with me now? I will say a line first and you repeat after me. Dear Jesus, we praise you. Thank you for being the King of Kings. Thank you for being the Lord of my life. Amen. Have a blessed Palm Sunday, my friends. I can't wait to get to see you again. Right now, we're going to sing a song, Hosanna. Join me. And what an awesome king that we have who took the way of sacrifice out of love for us. So thank you for that message. And kids, we're going to sing together Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. So if you have your palm branch at home that you made or maybe something else that you can wave in celebration, uh, this is a song where you get to wave your branches and dance around as we praise our King Jesus.
Good morning. Uh, Our scripture reading this morning comes from uh, the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 19, and we'll read verses 28 to 40. Before we do that, let's pray for the light of the Spirit. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to open your word. We thank you for the opportunity to read about your journey to the cross. And Lord, we we pray that as we read your word and as we hear Pastor Moses uh, share a message uh, regarding your word, we pray that you would open our hearts to learn more about the journey you took for salvation for our sins. So Lord, we just pray that you would bless us. We pray that you would bless Pastor Moses. We pray that you would uh, reveal yourself to us in your word. In your name we pray. Amen. So Luke 19, beginning at verse 28 which is the triumphal entry. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage in Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Tell him, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down, the the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Al, for that reading. Today is today's Palm Sunday. It's usually a day when we would probably have Andrew walk down the aisle with a donkey. Um, follow behind him, following behind him would be the children of our church who would be waving the palm branches, looking all cute and looking all excited because it's the one day they can create ruckus in the sanctuary and no one really, actually, they kind of enjoy it. Um, Possibly followed by some of our children at heart, maybe like people like Eno. There's a level of energy that would surround us as we would welcome Holy Week to the life of our church. And for the next week, we'd have many opportunities to come into church to celebrate or remember Jesus the King. But the reality is this. That yes, it is Holy Week, but... Here I stand in front of a pretty empty sanctuary. We did not have an actual processional. We do not have a donkey or Andrew. And we're faced with the reality that we will be spending our second Easter Sunday separated in our own homes. The the festivities that often get associated with Easter is not here. The energy that it brings, the images that we often associate with Palm Sunday is not to be found here. And believe it or not, that's actually kind of a good representation of Palm Sunday from the Lucan reading that Al read for us. See, when we look at Matthew's account of Jesus' entrance into the city of Jerusalem, it is a festivity of sorts. We see in Matthew chapter 21, a very large crowd had appeared and they are shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. It goes so far as to say that the whole city was stirred up. The whole city was stirred. When we look at John's account of this triumphal entry, we see that just before Jesus had raised Lazarus, his friend, from the dead. In one of the suburbs of the city of Jerusalem, 
Jesus had raised someone from the dead. Not just someone who was lying dead for one day, but a person who was dead dead. Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, and now this superstar was making his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. So now we have a crowd that is following Jesus. There's a level of expectation that Jesus is going to do something amazing wherever he goes. But what we find in Luke is not your typical exciting Palm Sunday. It seems a bit subdued. It seems like it's kind of fitting with where we are today. There is no crowd that is following Jesus. In fact, the only people that we see in the reading from today are his disciples. In verse 37, it says, When he came near the, mount, near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully praise God. Of course, you may think that Luke is speaking to the 12 disciples or the 70 disciples, but when we actually look at the Greek, the original language that Luke has written, the word is matheton, matheton, which is usually the word that is used to speak of an apprentice, an apprentice. So we're talking about people who were actually following Jesus. They weren't simply following him because, wow, look at that, look at that guy. But we're actually talking about people who are following him because they want to be like him. They want to learn from him. It's not just a one-day following, but a person who, who continues to train and train and train to be like Jesus. So what Luke is really saying is that, yeah, I know you want to equate this crowd to those who yelled a few days later, crucify him. But you know what? That's not what I'm trying to say. The people that we find in Luke 19 are people who actually follow Jesus, who actually live their life according to Jesus. But there's one thing about this Lucan account which is probably a little, it's a question mark that, is raised as you read it, it's the existence of the Pharisees. And their question, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Rebuke your disciples who have been praising joyfully and shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. I mean, I'm not sure what part of that sentence made the Pharisees identify the disciples as troublemakers, but it certainly made the Pharisees uncomfortable. And Jesus' response to this is, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. The stones will cry out. Turn to your neighbor and say, the stones will cry out. I mean, I guess God can make anything happen out of rocks. He was the one that allowed a stream of water to flow unendingly from a rock. We probably all recall the stone account that comes in the Advent text in Matthew chapter 3 when John the Baptist ruse the Pharisees and Sadducees saying that God could raise up children of Abraham out of these stones. We'll all remember how the devil tempted Jesus to make these stones into bread. See, stones... They have a theological significance in the Bible. In fact, biblical commentators have argued that the stones that are being mentioned here in Luke has a direct relationship with Psalm 118, which, has to, which is where the Palm Sunday chorus of Lord save us, Hosanna, comes from. It's a direct translation of the word Hosanna, Lord save us. But when we think that one of the most often quoted scripture with stones actually appears just a few verses before Lord saves us in Psalm 118. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. So is this the reference that Jesus is making when he says, these stones will cry out? That even those who may seem like rejected stones, including to the thinking of the Pharisees, thinking that these these disciples, that these, these apprentices that are following Jesus, they're rejected stones. Why is it so important for the Pharisees to name these rejected stones crying out, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord? Are they concerned that these 
rejected stones or these rejected apprentices from society will become the cornerstone of the new Israel, the stones that act as the centerpiece in a building. Quite honestly, we may never know exactly what Jesus was speaking to, and I think we could maybe wrestle our way into trying to discern what God is trying to say this morning. As I said, we will never know. But I hope that we can wrestle our way through that this morning. The rocks will cry out. For those of you who know me well, or well enough, or you are intuitive and you have been listening to me for about a year and a half and you probably can generally picture what Moses is like, you probably would have been able to deduce that I am not a big fan of hiking trails. Let's just say that it's one of my growing edges as I live in Barrie. But the one thing that I really don't enjoy is mountain hiking. See, for me, mountains are there to look at to look at in awe of God's majestic wonder, not for conquering it, not for climbing. It's it's there to look. But there's one thing that I learned in my experience hiking on mountain trails, and there are not many, but if there's one thing that I learned, it's the importance of rocks, especially stone markers. My understanding is that all stones have a unique color, unique shape. They, they kind of look the same to me, but they all have unique colors. They all have unique things. And so the distinctiveness of the rocks allow hikers to navigate themselves without having to rely on one of these. And so when you see a rock that is shaped a certain way, you know that you should be turning left or that you should turn right, or you should go back as you've made a wrong turn, or that you only have a few more minutes, I know it's hard to believe, before you get to the very top, and you can look out and so forth, right? So the stone is useful in giving us information, especially if you were someone who would walk that trail and walk by that stone on a regular basis. And so in some ways, you, you, are, you are growing with the stone, right? Right? Not, not for a person like me who, who, who won't go on trails, but maybe for a person like Nathaniel who grew up walking the trails out in BC, who regularly goes out on trails. You're changing. You're growing. You're getting bigger. Yet the stone is always there. So, <coughs> is there nothing that is happening with the rock? Although we cannot personify a stone, give it intellect and feelings, if you would venture with me trying to get into this piece of rock and imagine with me that this rock has eyes and can see, God can do anything, right? So let's imagine with me. It has sat there, maybe from the time of creation to this very point. It has seen numerous people go up that mountain. It may have seen young Nathaniel, maybe it may have seen young Nathaniel go up with his father when he was a little kid. And the rock would have seen Nathaniel grow as he would practice for the cross-country team. Maybe when he would bring his first date or during the time when Nathaniel may be stressed and just need some time to de-stress. Or the time when Nathaniel would walk along with his first child, putting the child on his shoulders And then as Nathaniel grows older, where he needs the support of a pole to walk those trails, that stone would still be there. That rock has now seen the progression of change that had been happening in Nathaniel's life. Nathaniel may have changed. His life circumstances may have changed. His family situation may have changed. But the stone has not. The stone has sat there. But the stone has seen the changes that have taken place. And so when I think about that rock that was on the road to Jerusalem, where people would be running back and forth, where kids would be playing around, where the Roman soldiers would ride on their horses and go in and out of the city, that stone would have seen it, everything. The stone would probably have heard it, all of it. The stone probably would have experienced it. 
From the moment that God created the stone into being, the stone would have experienced it, all of it. The fall of mankind, God's plan of love to redeem humankind, God's continued way of keeping covenant with his people. In providing this land as the Israelites were exiling through the desert before they settled into Canaan, the way the Israelites continued to turn away from God and God's desire to reach out to his people. How this old city was run over by different powers and now about this man who was roaming around in Galilee, healing people, teaching wonderful things, doing miracles. And now that person was finally coming into Jerusalem. From the time of creation, there was something that was building to this point, a narrative that has been building. And if that stone had seen all of what I had just shared, how could the rocks stay silent? How could the rocks not cry out if it could? If this rock had seen the entire narrative of God's continued work of redemption and have seen Jesus coming down the road, how could this rock not cry out? But maybe you're thinking, Moses, are you maybe taking this way out of context? Well, maybe. But what we see in this Luke text and in the way Luke is framing this is what They had seen. In Luke 37, Luke writes of how the disciples began to praise God for all the miracles and for what they had seen. The things the disciples had seen. The things the rock had seen. The things that we have seen. In some ways, we are no different than the rocks. The rocks have seen God's continued work of love and redemption to his people. In fact, oftentimes, they have the very best view. And so do we. Through Scripture, through the Bible, we have come to see God's continued action of love and justice towards His people. And now to us, we see it. We have heard and we have seen the love of Jesus manifest itself in the stories of healing. We have heard and seen stories of Jesus' love to those who need Jesus' love. To be that a tax collector or a widow, a prostitute or a leper. We have heard and seen how God promised that he would never leave us or forsake us or punish us ever again with the flood. We have heard and seen of God's love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We have seen and we have heard of the good news that God shares with us through Jesus Christ which we'll be celebrating in just a few more days. We have seen and heard just as the stones have seen and heard. And if the stones could talk, they will cry out, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And as people who have seen and heard I wonder if we too can respond that way. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. I wonder if we could join forces and share that wonderful news that the king who will free us from all the bondage of slavery has already paid the price. Will we shout out or will we choose to stay silent? And let the stone shout out instead. Brothers and sisters of First Berry, we see, if we look at the entire narrative of the Luke's gospel, we see something that is building. Luke repeatedly uses the Greek word plethos, plethos, like plethora, right? Um, He continues to use this Greek word in the Gospel of Luke and also in the Acts of the Apostles. It speaks to a great number, a great number of angels, a host of angels shouted out, a great number of fish, a great number of people. Something great is happening. Luke is continuing to speak to its readers. Something great, something big. Something great is happening. 
and something great is happening. And we see it again right here in Luke chapter 19. The entry into Jerusalem marks something big, so big that it would stop the traffic on the 400. We know what that is, and we have seen and we have heard. Luke is inviting us to get on board for that awesome, big, great number thing that is happening soon and very soon. Will you shout out that wonderful news? Over the last six weeks, we have started on a journey called Lent. But we have also been very intentional in the message that we are giving. What is the gospel? What is the gospel? It is good news. It's a story about something that has happened. And our response has to do with our relationship with that event that has taken place. Now this stone is a stone that just sat outside, probably on, on my left-hand side. If you go out the exit doors, there are a few rocks that are out there. Now I don't know which quarry it is from. I don't know if it was actually sitting here and someone placed it there. But it has continued to see, continued to listen to what is happening. They have seen this church struggle. They have seen when the beams of this church went up. They have seen when people had disputes about what they wanted changed in this church. But what they have continued to see, that in the midst of everything, they have seen our congregation who had continued to respond to what they had seen and heard in Scripture, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so I wonder if we can continue to do that. I realize that we don't have kids who are waving their palm branches. I recognize that this is an empty sanctuary. I recognize that we are all wrestling through this pandemic during this Holy Week. But I wonder, as people who had seen and heard, I wonder if we can respond for at least this week to that amazing news, amazing good news, that amazing gospel story that we had seen and heard and then we'll celebrate again in a week's time. Will you respond? Will you come and follow me? Let's pray. God, we are, we are grateful for this opportunity to, to walk through Holy Week once again. And God, we never really had that intent. We just realized that... Um, You know, it's, it's Holy Week. We want to celebrate. We are restricted in, in, our, in our own houses. But God, I wonder as we read through the Palm story or Luke's account of it and we see a story That speaks to us. God, we see a story of how Jesus rebukes the Pharisees and says, if they keep silent, the rocks will shout out. God, we as people who have experienced that wonderful story, have heard that story, and who have formed a relationship with that story, God, if you are urging or if you're moving within our hearts, God, I pray that we can shout out. Blessed are you. Blessed are you who brings peace. Blessed are you who brings us joy. 
Blessed are you who brings us love. Blessed are you who loves us so much. And God, I wonder if we can respond to that wonderful story by following you. Through this week and through the weeks, the years to come. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus calls us to follow him when we make him the Lord of our lives. And that may mean something different than we expect. So as we sing these words, um, the first four verses are actually Jesus' words to us. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? And the fifth verse is our response. Let's sing together. for our congregational ministry, ministries of the church, and the second offering will be for our benevolence fund. Um, our mission in our church is to continue to grow in love for God and for our neighbors. Um, and one of the wonderful things um, about one of the ministries that the deacons do is to reach out to our community, our neighbors who are in need. Um, if you know of anyone, or if you are going through some difficulties, um, please do not hesitate and contact any of the deacons um, or your elder um, so that we, to help us to become God's loving hands and feet, 
to you and to our neighbors. Before we come to God in prayer, um, I have an update um, that uh, Kim Selker could send me an update about John and Anne Van Schubert. And I'm just going to read this letter to our faith family. This has been an unimaginable time for us. Both mom and dad were admitted to hospital with COVID two weeks ago. Both of their courses took very different paths. Each of them were on high concentration of oxygen, but mom has been able to come down to a much lower livable level. She is very weak and slowly regaining strength. Dad's journey has been much different. He has required more oxygen and support and has been and remains on a ventilator. There are slow minor improvements and then setbacks as happen with critically ill patients. One of those setbacks has led to the amputation of his right leg below the knee. This was done to prevent infection from that leg from spreading to his entire body, which would be catastrophic. He presently remains on life support, including antibody and other therapies. Obviously, he knows nothing of what has happened. We're thankful that he and mom are alive and still have the potential to come home. However, it is a critical and tenuous situation. God has been good to us in ways we couldn't imagine. He has put a dream team of healthcare workers in place for both of them. He has shown us his grace and mercy through the outpouring of love and support from all of you and our many co-workers and friends. The teams are astonished at the number of cards that keep coming. He has spoken to us in ways that calm our hearts. We can't be more thankful. We hear the truth that mom and dad has grown in us over the years in Jeremiah 29 11 that he knows the plans he has for us and we trust that regardless of the outcome our God will be our refuge and our strength. We continue to covet your prayers for full healing knowing that he supplies all our needs according to his riches in glory. We continue to ask that you communicate with mom and dad through the RVH email system and not via phone to allow the family rest and recovery. With thankful and humbled hearts, Kim and Todd Selkirk, Kevin and Ann, Daryl and Kelly Van Schubert, and all the grandchildren, if you can have them in your prayers. Um. And um, my name is Nathaniel, and we'll be coming to God in prayer in the prayers of the people this morning. Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise for your glory. Today, we remember the triumphant entry of your Son into Jerusalem. And as we enter Holy Week, help us to worship you with our hearts, minds, words, and actions. Lord, through this COVID time, we pray for those, our first responders. We pray for all those working for the the many physical needs and mental needs of our congregants and also for our community. Lord, during this COVID time, we sometimes feel like we're walking in the dark, but we know that you are near, that you are our comfort, and our only comfort in life and in death. We hold especially members of our community in prayer today. We pray for Elka and Jane Chertsma and their family with Elka's recent diagnosis of melanoma. Lord, help them through this time as they work through a treatment plan. We pray for John and Ann Van Schubert and their families. Give them strength and let them know that you are near and help their faith to shine through to those around them. Lord, we pray also for Stacy Taylor and Jeff Taylor along with the Taylor and Caswell families, through especially the next week. We pray for the doctors and nurses, give them clarity of mind and wisdom as they monitor Stacy and, and the three little ones growing in her womb. Lord, you knit each one of us and we are known to you. Be near to Stacy and Jeff and give them strength for the week ahead. Lord, we also pray for our church communities. We discern whether to call Nick and Amy Bowling. Give us clarity of mind as to whether their gifts can help us perform our mission to love you and love our neighbor. Give the bowlings peace as they discern God's calling for the next step 
in their family's journey. Lord, remember those that are sick and homebound in our community. Give them peace and strength in the days ahead as we remember your sacrifice on the cross and look forward to your second coming. Lord, it is your name that we pray all these things. Amen. Stephanie, <clears throat> for that um, wonderful um, offertory. It has been uh, wonderful to worship with you. I wonder, after the service, if you can maybe go out, pick up a rock, look at it, try to listen to it if it says Hosanna. But I wonder if you can bring it in and look at it throughout this holy week as it's, you're reminded to shout out. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. As people who have heard the wonderful news of Jesus Christ, people who have seen and heard, people who are part of God's wonderful narrative of love for us, I wonder if you can place that as part of your spiritual exercise each day. And uh, be reminded that each day you will be getting uh, a short midweek devotional a daily devotional for Holy Week. And I hope that that can help enrich um, your spiritual walk during this Holy Week. A reminder that there is worship at 7 p.m. on YouTube and also that you're invited to Good Friday worship service also on YouTube. Our final song, um, our final song is Man of Sorrow. Please stand as you're able as we respond.
sisters in Christ. You know, ever since the start of creation, God has continued to speak to us. Uh, I love you. I care for you. You are my children. You are mine. And there's no better representation to that than the, the days that are, to, that are coming in Holy Week. And so I want to encourage you to walk. Walk with the Lord. Walk with Jesus as people who have seen and heard of God's great love for us. I encourage to walk with the Lord. Shout out. And as you go forth from here, may God go before you to lead you. God go behind you to protect you. God go beneath you to support you. And God go beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid. For we have seen and heard of God's wonderful story of love, of grace, and of mercy. It has now become our story. And so go forth in the joy that it brings as we walk together through Holy Week from this day and forevermore. Amen.